Father God, we thank you so much for the brother and the sister to our right and left, and God, we pray blessing upon them right now. Father, as we hold their hand, we're so grateful that you hold them. We're so grateful you'll never, ever let them go. We're grateful, Lord, that you brought them to this place tonight because you love them and because you desire intimacy with them. So, Father, we pray a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon their lives. We pray there would be an overflow where the Spirit of God would not just be in them, but overflowing upon their life, God. We pray for open ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church in this place. God, we are believing for an encounter with you where you read our mail and you call us deeper, deeper in trust and faith, God. Have your way in this place tonight. We pray this, Father, for your pleasure. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. You may be seated. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to have to wait on that. We're going to have to wait because we've got to get started on this. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll do it a little later. Let's go open your Bibles up to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And take a look with me here at verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he said, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call you, lie down again. And he went and laid down. Then the Lord yet called Samuel again. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called. And he answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. So Samuel did not yet know the Lord, for the word of the Lord had not yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be. If he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel laid down until morning. And opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here I am. He said, what is the word of the Lord that spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me and all the things he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything. And he hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan the north to Beersheba the south, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, which happened to be the capital at the time, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Wow. What an incredible story where Samuel, check it out, gets to hear the voice of God. Do you hear the voice of God? Does God speak to you? 
You know, we talked Sunday as we looked at the voice of our bridegroom, Jesus, going through Song of Solomon too. What an incredible picture that God actually wants to talk to us. I mean, it was like that from the beginning, wasn't it? The voice of the Lord God was in the garden, right? And he was calling out to those that had ran away from him. It was the very voice of God that created us. And God said, let there be a man and create him in our image. The voice of God, we were created by the voice of God to hear the voice of God. Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. When you have intimacy with God, you know when God is talking to you. Samuel was just a kid. We looked at last week's that he, Hannah dropped him off basically somewhere between three and five there under Eli's tutorage, if you would, to learn what it meant to bring offerings before the Lord. Just a little kid. He's around 12 years old here, and he had never heard the voice of the Lord. God called him out one incredible evening, or should I say really, really early morning. There's some things in this chapter that if you're here today and you're going, man, I would love to know what it's like to hear the voice of God. I, I, I want to understand what it's like to have him lead me by that still, small voice people talk about. I mean, there are some people in this world, they say they hear voices all the time. Right? I mean, I encounter some people that are demon-possessed, and they say I have a problem where I hear voices. Demons are talking to them. Demons want to talk to people, but not as much as God wants to talk to his bride. If you're one of those saints here today that goes, man, I want to know how to hear the word of the Lord. Well, the first place you do want to start is the word of God. You just go, okay, he gave us this big love letter called the Bible. He says, here's my letter to you. I want to share with you my heart and my mind. As he said in chapter two last week, I want to raise up a prophet who speaks my heart, who speaks my mind. Man, it's right here, is it not? You know, and yet there are still people that read through this from beginning to end time and time again, and they're still not knowing, experiencing the voice of the Lord. There are people that are professional seekers and listeners, if you would. They go to seminary, and they get a degree, and they quote scripture, and they still don't know the Lord. Isn't that crazy? Men and women who devote themselves to the voice of God and hearing and repeating what he has to say, and yet they don't know the Lord. God forbid that would be anyone in this room. And there are things in this chapter about the life of Samuel. See, Samuel, if you would, I look at this as kind of like a, a prep school for prophecy. It's like, because we should all want to prophesy. Now, I know some of you here today go, well, I don't believe in the gift of prophecy. We have the Bible. I want you to understand what I mean by that is speaking forth the word of God. See, I can take a Bible verse and I can quote it without any passion or anointing of the Holy Spirit, and it means nothing. It's just intellect, you see? But when the Spirit of God anoints it, it changes lives. That's why the men on the road to Emmaus said, man, when he spoke, didn't our hearts burn within us? Jesus came quoting all these Old Testament scriptures that the Pharisees were preaching, but it was different when Jesus said it. <laughs> they were hearing the voice of God when it was the same Old Testament scriptures. I mean, even, even the, the, the prayer that we read, the Our Father prayer, right? Even that is just a collaboration of Old Testament scriptures that he just took this beautiful potluck and went, boop, there it is. And it's powerful because it was anointed, right? When, people, when, when, when the, see, Jesus teaches how to pray, sure, I'll tell you. And he starts rambling these scriptures and putting all these things that they've already heard. But now they're hearing the voice of the Father through those words. We are called to be eager to desire to prophesy. Do you know that? 1 Corinthians 14, we said we should be eager, desire. In other words, Lord, I, I don't want to be big on the gifts that make me look like something spiritual. I want to be big on the gifts that edify. And there's nothing more edifying for the body of Christ than to hear Papa God speak. When he comes and speaks and, and, and a word, it just penetrates. It's one thing when I come up and say, hey, you know what? God has forgiven you of all of your sins. And, and if your heart's hard and, and I'm living a hypocritical, hypocritical uh, lifestyle and I'm not really walking in the spirit, there's going to be no manifest presence of God in what I'm speaking. You know, that's one of my greatest fears, if you would, is I get caught up into a religiosity and a pharisaical lifestyle and I get up here week in, week out, and I just give you intellect. Please just leave and find another church. 
really. Because it, you sit there and you just, you just shrivel. And that's what happens. A lot of people, they walk into buildings and they're hearing the Bible, but they're not hearing the Lord speak. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? And so Eli and his sons, they were speaking the word of the Lord. You know, they had the scriptures, they had the writings of Moses, they had, but they, they would have the scriptures and, and they would go, man, the word of the Lord says we need to have the table of showbread and the word of the Lord spoke and said we need to do this with the altar of incense and the word of the Lord says we need to have a lampstand and fill it with oil and yep, Exodus 27, that scripture right there, it tells us that we're to have a perpetual flame burning continuously all the time. They had the word of the Lord directing them, but it was just intellect. They still weren't really hearing the Lord. See, Eli never heard the voice of the Lord. Do you know that? He was the high priest, and he never heard the Lord. When he did hear God was last week in chapter 2, where it says a man of God came who was a prophet. We all know his name. But he came to prophesy, to speak the word of the Lord to Eli because Eli just had these, you know, compact nuggets of wax put in his spiritual ear. He's not hearing anything from God. His sin had blocked his ears from hearing the Lord, right? But Samuel, this young 12-year-old kid, He's, he's listening. The Lord's speaking to him, and I love Samuel's response. He says, speak, Lord, ready, for your servant is listening. Powerful keys there. If you want to be someone who hears the word of the Lord, you need to be a servant, and you need to listen. Now, you might go, well, okay, what does it mean to be a servant, and what does it mean to listen? It's very broad. It's very generic, right? Because my concept and your concept of what a servant is or what listening is could be two or 20 different things. But what really matters is what is his concept of being a servant and what's his concept of listening, right? If we would get more down to what he's saying, we'd have more unity in the body of Christ. Well, I want you to take note of, if you want to be someone who hears the word of the Lord, you want to walk in obedience. You want to prophesy. You want to be a sounding board for the throne of God. In other words, I'm not here to just kind of speak forth the things I want to say and slap a fish or a dove on it. I want to be live as Memorex, man. I want to hear what God is saying and repeat only what he's saying. As Paul said, if one speaks, let him speak as speaking the very words of God. I want to hear what you're saying like the elders in the book of Revelation. I hear it and I say, amen, Right? If I want to be someone like that, the first thing I need to do is what we read here in the life of Samuel. Look at this. Verse 1, it says, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Check it out. Here Samuel is in this time where there's no widespread revelation. In other words, that prophet that came last week and just read Eli's mail and said, man, you, you're, you're, you care more about being a friend to your kids than being a father to your kids. Big problem, buddy. Before that prophet came... There was no prophetic inside. This was like your, your uh, typical morgue on the church corner, right? You ever walked into a church and you just go, let me check these people for a pulse. You know what I mean? It's like it, it, either that or you go, it's a circus. That's, not, that's still dead too. That's just flesh, right? But you just go, this is what this is like. It was like there was lots of going through the motions, lots of religious stuff, but spiritually, it was dead, okay? But not for Samuel, as we know, he hears the word of the Lord. And the key was, his heart was to minister to the Lord. He said, speak, Lord, for your servant. He said, I'm a servant. How do you know you're a servant? You know you're a servant when your worship is about him. It's not about you. It's not about the song that you want to hear. It's not about the drums. That was cool. <laughs> you know, it wasn't about, wow, there's a lot of energy in the room. We can go to a cult. You can walk into a kingdom hall and get some energy in a room. You can walk to a Mormon church and get some energy in a room. That doesn't mean the voice of God is speaking, okay? The voice of God is speaking when we come with one heart to say, I'm here to honor you. I'm here to serve you. It's not a matter of, Lord, I need, I need, I need. It's, Lord, you're worthy, you're worthy, you are worthy, okay? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. I'm not here to say, God, let's make a deal. I'm not here to go, well, Lord, in Jesus' name, I can get whatever I want. You said so, so I got my list, Santa Claus. That's not serving the Lord, 
okay? Serving the Lord is like coming up before the Father and saying, Dad, how are you today? How are you? Well, that's ridiculous, Dave. I already know how he's doing. He's God. Hello. He's doing great. He's perfect. What a stupid question. Do you know God can grieve? Jesus, without sin, cried. There's areas in your life that are a stench to the nostrils of God. And if you ask him how he's doing, he might say, something stinks. Well, maybe that's why I don't like to ask him how he's doing. Hmm. Right? I like the cotton candy Christianity where everything is wonderful and God is good all the time and all the time God is good and all this. Wait a minute. Are you here to serve him or serve you? This happy, feel-good Christianity of worship is not worship in spirit and truth. It's worship in flesh. And here Samuel had not even heard the word of the Lord. In other words, that picture of salvation in the Old Testament, he had not that, that personal encounter with the presence of God, and yet he's ministering to the Lord. That's powerful. See, people go, well, I, I can't help but be a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, if I do wrong, it's, it's understandable. I'm a sinner. Do you know there are people who stop drinking and they're not saved? There are people that stop infidelity in their marriage, and they're not even born again. Why? Because God's given everyone a measure of faith to, to will to do good and to do it. He has. He has shown you that he's the king of kings, lord of lords, and there's no other God but him through creation, through your very own body that was created, through all kinds of things he does. And he tells you, and you have the ability to say, I'm going to live to serve him. I'm not going to do the whole Frankie Sinatra and do it my way. That's, that's everybody's lifestyle, right? I want to do it my way and slap the fisher dove on it. That's not the heart of a servant, and you will not hear the voice of God. I want you to hold your place in 1 Samuel 3 and look at this extremely powerful area of Scripture in the book of Psalms, chapter 29. I tell you, this, this verse, if you want to talk about hearing the voice of the Lord, man, pow, this is it. Look at this. Psalms 29 and look with me at verse 3. Verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them salsa skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. And the voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says, glory. The Lord has enthroned at the flood and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Man. The voice of the Lord rocks, New Testament, okay? Contemporary, it rocks your world. When you hear God, it changes everything. Now, I know you're going, this is so cool, Dave. Samuel, 12 years old, he's just this little ankle biter, wet behind the ears, and he's rocking it with the Lord. He's hearing God. This is amazing. And the voice of the Lord, it just shakes up everything in your life. Okay, I want to be a servant. I want to hear the voice of the Lord. Well, I skipped the first couple of verses for a really good reason because the first couple of reasons, the first couple of verses, you know what he's doing? It's serving the Lord. Check it out. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Wow. If you want verses 3 here through 11 where the voice of the Lord rocks your world and strips your life bare of everything that's not him and you really want to hear God in that fashion, it begins like Samuel, I'm here to minister to you. I'm here to serve you, Lord. I'm here to give glory to your name or your character. I'm here to give glory to the beautiness and, your whole, and the holiness of who you are in my life. I'm here to enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. It's all about you, okay? Okay. 
But what happens is we come into the house of the Lord of the temple and we sit there and go, man, life's really hard. My wife, she needs medication. My boss is demon possessed. I, I, you know, it, it, we go, and we go down our list of things of why we're bummed, right? And we're going, but God, I really want you to speak to me. I need your help. I'm here to tell you that's not a servant's heart. You're not going to hear the Lord. You will not. It will block your ears from hearing the voice. It's not that he's not speaking, because check it out. Samuel was hearing the Lord speak, and Eli wasn't, right? So here, Samuel's hearing a voice again, 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 and again, and Eli's going, I'm not hearing anything. And in Samuel's mind, he thinks it's the voice of the man. Many times people think, this is a really cool text here. It must have been that something like the whole tent shook, and all of a sudden, there was a voice that came to, to, to Samuel, like, Samuel, you know, like that, right? We, we think it was just something like earth-shattering, something out of a Stephen King movie. No, it was like in Samuel's mind where he's hearing a voice, and it sounds like a man's voice, right? It's a voice in his head, but Eli ain't hearing it. He's not hearing it. Why? Because his heart's not the heart of a servant. His heart is the heart of what's in it for me, the accolades of being the high priest, I care more, he had a political heart. I care more, like with his kids. His kids were doing all types of wicked things. It was like the Corleone house around the temple where there's extortion going on with the sacrifices. Remember that last week? It was wicked, man. They have actually got women that they're manipulating spiritually and having sex there in the temple of God, in the tent, in the tabernacle. How sick is that? Men of God actually manipulating and using their influence as a son of the priest. And Eli does nothing. Why? Because he cares more about being their buddy, Phineas' buddy, than he does honoring Father God. If you want to be a prophet, you can't be a politician as well. If you want to prophesy, you can't be too worried about what people think about you. And let me tell you what, when it comes down to caring what people think about you, the heart of that many times is tested, and the real prep school is with ourselves as parents. I've been tested, as many of you know in this room, so many times with my four kids that I just wanted to bury on several occasions. Right? I can say that in love. They know. Yeah, bury them, yes. Right? <laughs> Jacob in the back, bury them. Yeah, you have no idea. If I wasn't crying, I was getting my teeth, one of the two. But it was like I was being tested to go, okay, am I going to say what they want me to say or am I going to say what you want me to say, Lord? Eli was someone who was only going to say what benefited him. Samuel got tested as we were in the chapter, did he not? Samuel not only was a heart of not a politician but wanted to be a prophet, echo the word of the Lord. He was the heart that says, I want to serve you versus Eli. Think about this. Here Eli, he's supposed to have the responsibility there in the holy place keeping the lamp full of oil, right? That was his responsibility. Now, he wasn't going to do it because he's old and lethargic and pathetic. And his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, well, they're off fornicating and stealing from the people of God. So they don't give a rip about the lamp that's going out. But who did care about the lamp? Who did care about the oil being full? It was Samuel. He cared about, Lord, this is what pleases you. I'm not worried about what pleases my flesh. I'm not worried about what pleases these guys that are authority in my life and abusive authority in my life. I'm not worried so much about this guy who's passive in his abuse, Eli. I'm concerned about what honors you, and I'll do whatever that is. If you want to prophesy, you have to have a heart that says, Lord, my primary concern, Father, is what you're telling me to do, and I know there'll be a cost in that. Hear that. There will be a cost. God will make sure that you are tested. I mean, it was just like when, you know, all the crowd came to Jesus. Jesus, you need to come and heal Lazarus. He's sick. He's your friend. And he sat there for days until he died. It made Jesus look like total lame didn't it? You call yourself a friend, and you have the power to heal. But Jesus is going, Father, what do you want? I'm not too worried about what they think. What do you want? Okay? You have to have a heart to say, I'm here to serve you. I'm here to minister to you. 
And you know that you're listening to God when you have a heart that serves and wants to honor him versus honoring yourself with, again, a fish or a dove slapped on it. That was Eli's lifestyle. In other words, one is a real vibrant relationship. One is religion. One has life. One has death. If you want to prophesy, check it out. Here's the great news. It comes with a heart that says, basically, I'm saying, I want to hear you speak to me, and I'm willing to repeat whatever you tell me to say, Lord. Samuel, turning back with me. Look with this. Let's take a look at a couple more verses here. I know we read the overview of the story, but there's some incredible points here I want to cover with you. Verse 4, where the Lord called to Samuel. And Samuel said, here I am. Of course, he gets up and goes to Eli. And Eli tells him, I did not call you. Now go lie down. And he went his way. Now here in verse 6 and verse 7, we see this repeated. All right? God is speaking to Samuel. Samuel doesn't know it's the Lord yet, but it said he ministered to the Lord in verse 1 and 2. But it's the Lord under Eli. In other words, there was an authority in his life that we all know was not a spiritual authority. It was a very fleshly and carnal authority. And what I just, when I read this story last week, the thing that amazed me is I see, okay, here's this young guy in prophecy prep school. His heart is being prepared to honor the Lord. And God puts him under a wicked authority, and his sons are wicked as well. And you know what he does? He submits. He submits. You cannot say, I want to be someone who says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening and have this keen, sensitive heart to the voice of God, and yet you dishonor authority here on earth. You can't. Now you go, Dave, I like that a lot better about being, you know, a God pleaser, not a man pleaser. I'm going to do what God tells me to do. I liked that a lot better. That fit my mindset a lot better. What you're talking about, I have got some issues with. Well, then clearly you have some issues because they both work together. Well, do we, don't I come into places where I have to either choose to obey God and, or obey man? Yeah, but usually that's not the case. Usually that's our immaturity. Usually that's our rebellious heart and our running from the healing hand of God because we have wounds inflicted in our life. So we justify dealing with his hand of healing in our life by taking this moral, spiritual high ground. Okay? Been there, done this. As many of you know, I've been through enough spiritual abuse in the body of Christ for the last 30 years to write a book about it. I could tell you so many stories where I've been under Eli's. Who they, I, and I look back and I kind of I wonder, did they even really know the Lord? Now, I didn't really know much because I was young and stupid and ignorant, but well-meaning, you know. And now I'm just older, stupid, and well-meaning. It just doesn't change much as you get older, you know. Thank God for his grace. But, but I look back and I go, man, so Lord, you were developing an ability for me to humble myself and die to self and be like Jesus on the cross that says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Jesus submitted himself under who? Caiaphas? Herod? Are you kidding me? Now, we, it's, it's easy for us to go, I want to be like Jesus, man, who's on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he just starts this, this, this metamorphosis takes place with this glory inside him and changes from the inside out, and he hears the voice of the Father, and even, man, the disciples were there, and they were like, this is far, I want to be like Jesus. Well, Jesus was someone who submitted to Eli's. Why? Why does the Lord take someone with such a heart that wants to run after truth and goodness and worship God and give glory to him, the splendor of his holiness, all that the voice of God might come and transform his life? Why does God say prep school is under wicked religious people? Just like he did with his son Jesus. Because in the midst of that, you will learn to die. You learn to trust and it's protecting you. Check it out. If God gave a prophetic insight and the ability to walk in words of knowledge and wisdom and anointing to preach the Lord with charisma and all that to someone who didn't have the character and the sacrifice and the heart of a servant before the Lord, you know what happens? Those men and women draw people unto themselves versus point the way to Jesus. And you know what I'm talking about. There are Corinthians in our midst that are charismatic and do have a gift, 
Balaam had a gift. He was a prophet, but he didn't use it to serve the Lord. He used it to serve himself, right? So you can still have a gift and use it for your glory, but the end will be like the life of Eli. We'll read that next week. It doesn't turn out good, just so you know. God fulfills his word and his promise, his prophetic promise. God is developing these characters. So when, check it out. When it comes, our heart is like his heart. That way his word is presented with his heart. The word of God is presented with the love of God. So I know some people that have a prophetic gift and, and they're able to have inside discerning of spirits and, and able to pick up on things, but they come and deliver it in such arrogance. See, think about Samuel. He's got this word. That's a rough word. Hey, I mean, Eli's like his dad, right? I mean, he ra- he's raised him. He's like probably about 12 years old. Most commentaries put about 12. And so he's been there since he was between three and five years old when he was weaned. Eli, Eli is his dad, and Phineas and Hophni are his older brothers, wicked as can be. And now he gets this word of the Lord that they're dust in the wind. Are you kidding me? And he's got to share that with him. And then Eli comes and threatens him and say, listen, if you don't tell me exactly what was said, you're in big trouble. But I mean, he starts to manipulate him and threaten him. This kid, this poor kid, what he's going through. You mean what God put him through? Yeah, God's put him right there. But I love his heart. He took no joy. He wasn't like, boy, I can't wait to tell that hypocrite Eli this. God's going to get him. And some people walk in the prophetic like that. They sit there, and they come, and they take some scripture, and it's the truth, but there's no love. We speak the truth in love, amen? And when someone walks in the prophetic, the truth with love is spoken. Samuel, I believe, is heartbroken. He, He takes no joy in rebuking Eli. When someone really has the heart of a servant, God, I am your servant and I'm listening, then they share not only the truth of God but the love of God and their heart is broken when the word of God is presented. Now, listen closely. This takes time to develop. The first time, I remember someone came up to me when I was like 19 years old and and uh, the first time I experienced a word of knowledge where I said something no one else could know, and, and, and someone's like, how the heck did you know? And someone came to me. I didn't even know what a word of knowledge was. I, I had no idea, you know? And I'm like, word of knowledge, what's that? And, um, and they're like, hey, I think you have a prophetic gift. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I started to base my identity of me being accepted by people based on a gift I had versus the blood that was shed at Calvary. That's a problem. That was the Corinthians' problem. We love the gifts more than the gift giver. And our identity is, and look what a three-ring circus we are in the church. That's not a servant to the Lord at all. And when those gifts are poured out and we don't honor the Lord with them, we will honor ourselves with them. We will draw men unto ourselves, and the enemy has a field day. Just like with Eli, they had position, they had authority without the discipline, the character, and the servant's heart to say, Lord, this is all for you. It's all to please and honor you. That's why God gives you kids. It's not so you can go, hey, look how much little Mark looks like me. You know, oh, look at Michelle. She looks just like you, honey. She's got your lips. And we sit there and do all these things like, oh, aren't we wonderful? Even when someone comes, oh, your kids are beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Your kids are so intelligent. Yeah, well, they take after their mom. She's really smart, you know. Oh, my kid's going to kids that are causing me a doctor. Oh, wow, you did a great job, right? And even with parenting, somehow we gather together the multitudes to say, look at what we did. Unless, of course, it's a cane, then we say, well, it's not our fault. If it's an Abel, yes, super dad, super mom. If it's a cane, oh, it's a demonic, and the Lord had it, the enemy had his way, right? You can't have it both ways, So I don't want the glory, nor do I want the blame, because it's all about him. They're his kids. My job is to honor and speak what he speaks and to train them up in the Lord, right? That's what we're called to do. Eli wouldn't do that. Samuel had a heart that says, I'm sold out to do whatever you want me to do. And I love it how, because of that heart, God keeps on speaking to him. Now, see, he spoke three times, and all three times, Samuel's going, 
I, I'm getting confused here. <laughs> you know? and, and it's kind of like he's on his proverbial tricycle or his bike with the training wheels or hearing the voice of God. He's like, I, th- I think it's God. I, it's it's kind of like, you ever been like so, when you get a radio and you're like, I think I got the station. No, that way, no, that way. He's kind of trying to tune in like, what's going on here, right? And God does not get tired of him. He doesn't grow impatient with him. God is redundant. He repeats himself. Awesome. Because I'm a dummy and I need it. You know, I'm hard-headed, I'm stubborn, I'm stiff-necked, I'm fearful. I'm, I'm a little bleh, a sheep, right? Just like he's a shepherd, I'm just a dumb lamb. And, and, but he's so good the way he leads me. My sheep know my voice. And so he keeps repeating, but check it out. Samuel keeps getting up. If you want to be someone that hears the voice of God, when you hear something that you think is the voice of God, get up and go, okay, how does that line with the word of God? Because if it doesn't line with the scriptures, um, it's not his voice I'm hearing. That's a great place to start. In other words, is you should have a proverbial Eli in your life, not an Eli like Eli, but you should have a spiritual father in your life, someone that you can go, hey, I think I'm hearing the Lord. What do you think? Two or three witnesses, right? I, I want to know if this is the Lord, that to iron sharpening iron. I mean, who, if we want to be around, if we want to hear the voice of God, then I want to hang around people who hear the voice of God. That makes sense, Right? And then they have a track record of God honoring them. God honored Samuel. It said that none of his words would fall to the ground. God upheld his words because they were his words. And he honored him all the way from the north, the tribe of Dan, the Beersheba, to the furthest south. He honored him his whole life, man. How incredible is that? And if we want to be somebody like that, then we need to follow in Samuel's footsteps. And whenever we go, man, you're going to give me just this little bit of your voice, I'm going to grab a hold of it. And see, what happens is he gives us little things like what we do with our checkbook when he says, honor me. And we go, oh, that's definitely not the voice of God. Love my wife, honor my husband. That's not the voice of God. Train your children up in the way they shall go, man. Honor God in your house. Be as Joshua's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord no matter what it costs. Even my kids curse me. I will honor God above my own fear of rejection of my children. And I tell you, these things are training wheels for us hearing the voice of the Lord. What happens is we've got these areas in our life, such as our finances, man, our parenting, you know, forgiving a brother when God says, hey, care more about the relationship than what you think is right. These found, fundamental foundational things that we dishonor the voice of the Lord in. And then we say, but Lord, I want to walk in the prophetic. I want to walk in supernatural gifts, God, and I want to have words of knowledge and wisdom like you did, Jesus. I want to walk in such a power. But wait a minute, you're ignoring the entry-level voices of things he's trying to say in your life. You're not, that's why Peter says, hey, if you have a problem in your marriage, 1 Peter 3, do you know what hinders your prayer life? How many married people can say amen to that, right? I mean, when you've got a problem in your marriage and, and you have a bitter heart, do you know what hinders your ability to hear God? Because prayer is not, hey, God, bless my spaghetti. Prayer is a dialogue. Far out, Right? It is, I'm talking to the Lord, and I'm hearing the Lord. It's communication. And when you have a bitter root with your spouse, you can pray all you want. The Lord says, drop your sacrifice at the altar, this, quote, intimate time with me, and go deal with this. And we go, well, that's not the Lord. That's what Eli did. We have to continue to get up. And when we do, what happens is his voice gets louder and louder, more intense, He trusts us. If we're faithful with the little things, he gives us much. If we're faithful with the foundational things that he's told us right in his word about our own lives and our homes and our bank accounts. I I mentioned the bank accounts because that's only symbolic of where our heart's at, right? I mean, sometimes I think we don't talk about, I know we don't talk about money enough at Reveal Fellowship because we never talk about money and we never pass the plate. But you know what? Just for a moment, let me just bang you upside the head with this, okay? You'll love it, I'm sure if you're able to come into the house of God week in, week out, and you don't have symbolic offering to God with what's going on in your bank account, you're not hearing God. 
You're not. I'm telling you. And I love that we don't take an offering because if it's your first time here, believe me, you can't go. It's one of those churches always talk about money because we ain't, you know. Again, we don't talk about it enough, and we should because, again, it's an incredible exercise to say, Lord, I want to be obedient to hear your voice and honor you with everything that I am and everything that I have. So I want to honor you with my checkbook. I want to honor you with my spouse. I want to honor you with my kids. I want to honor you with my time. It's really not mine. It's yours. And as you do that, his voice keeps repeating, and he keeps telling you different things. And when he tells you one thing, and you obey it, and you honor it, then we're on to the next thing. You might have been stuck and neutral for the last five years and going, God's not talking. No, he's just been saying the same thing, and you ain't listening. And you're wondering why God's not talking to me. He's talking. You're just, you're borderline Eli is what's going on. But because he kept listening, I love this man. Oh, my gosh. Verse 10, it says, the Lord came and stood. Now, that's different than the other three times, right? Remember, three times the Lord spoke, but this time it says, then the Lord came and stood. An incredible, I personally believe, this is up for debate, but I believe a Christophany here because we know that a theophany is something like the burning bush. God is spirit. You know, he's not a body. But we see Jesus in the Old Testament constantly in a glorified body. Kind of like Jesus had restored me to the glory I had before the world began, a physical body. I believe you see none other than Jesus come like he did in the Garden of Eden, stand here. Because Samuel, there's more and more of his fear, more and more willing to be a servant, more and more willing to listen in every area of his life. And now the Lord, is not only his voice, it's his manifest presence. Some of you, there's a few of you here that need to hear this. Once you're sensitive to obey his voice, tell you, go to the right, go to the left, it gets deeper than just hearing his voice. You can get the manifest presence so thick to where you actually, I believe, feel God. I'm not kidding you. Now, please don't run off and call me a heretic. Oh, I can't fellowship with this. This is not something I'm preaching dogmatically. I'm just telling you what I see in the word of God where the presence of God comes and physical things happen. I mean, it's kind of like even in Pentecost, there was a sound audibly they could hear like a rushing wind. I mean, the presence of God can affect us physically. And I know there's churches that run off and they're seeking glory clouds and angel dust, and it gets a little far and weird. I get that. But let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. There is some truth to as you hear the presence of God that there are physical manifestations of his glory, his weightiness, his presence. And you might go, I want that. That's cool. Then listen to him. When he tells you to repent, stink and repent. When he tells you that's worldly, and he tells you as a parent, man, you are doing a lame job and your kids are suffering and I am not pleased. Stop being a politician and a friend and be a parent, man. For real. When he tells you do not love this world, stop reading your Bible and coming to church and throwing God a tip every now and then. Hey, God, here's a snow comb. You know, go buy yourself a hamburger, do whatever. And now I'm on with my life and do my thing. And then all the rest of the week, your Bible collects dust and you're never on your knees. You're never going, every day, God, it's your day. I'm here to be a servant. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? And no matter what it costs me in saying it, I will, God. Every day should be like that. When you do that, let me tell you what, He'll not only speak to you, he'll stand in your midst. The Spirit of God, that was the beauty of the Holy Spirit, man. John 20, Jesus breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They got saved that moment. Man, a month later, the Spirit of God came upon them, right? Different preposition. In them, upon them. Their cup was full of salvation, but when they obeyed the voice of the Lord to wait on the Lord, I hope you're drinking this in. This is good. Okay, I'm, I'm preaching to my own soul here. It's like, not only did they say, like, Lord, we're going to wait upon you. You, you got a promise. We've already received the Holy Spirit, but there's an overflow, a manifest presence of your heart and your promise supposed to take place if we'll just wait upon you. And in the, they sit there in that room, and they go, man, the whole world wants to kill us. It's Pentecost. Feasts of the Lord are going on, and the people that killed Jesus are out there, and they want to kill us, and they're not going to buy fish from us in our business. They're not going to hire us as, a, as, as any type of, of labor because they're not going to bless our business because we're a cult. Our lives are over with. We're desperate. There's nowhere to go but you, Lord. There's nowhere to go but you. We need to hear your voice. 
we need your presence, God. We need your provision. Lord, help us. And they sit there, and as they wait, desperation stirred in their hearts. And man, did God speak. Intense. What? That's what happened with Samuel. It built, it built, it built. And then the fourth time, the Lord stands in his presence and speaks to Samuel. And then after the voice came, Samuel was tested, wasn't he? Now that you've heard my voice, Samuel, will you obey what I said? Now the Lord already knew the answer. If the Lord would have spoke to him maybe a year ago, who knows, maybe Samuel would have not been ready to obey. Maybe his heart wasn't formed in the fashion of a servant and his ears keenly listening. Maybe he had to go through some years of sitting there filling the lampstand with oil and saying, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be filled with the Spirit. They're out there fornicating. I see them fornicating. They're having sex. There's orgies going on. They're drinking. They're, they're, they're filthy lucre's embezzlement with the people of God. All these things are going all around me, and I see it. I hear it. I smell it. But in the midst of that, no, Lord, I will honor you. Check it out. Wow, Dave, so you're saying that God put Samuel in the midst of wickedness to refine his heart unto purity and desperation. I've got to hear God. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. You might be there. You are there. There's things going on in your life, man, where you're being tested and you're being pressed in on both sides, up and down, and God is preparing your heart for a moment where he calls you by name. A moment where he's going to bring an increase of his manifest presence in your life to take you to a different era. He wants this, guys. This is, God is love, and he shows no favoritism unless you can just believe we're all his favorite, amen? And so he wants to speak to all of us. Dad wants to talk to all of his kids. I don't care if you're 48 or you're 14 here today. God looks at you and he says, you're mine and I want to speak to you. I want to carry you in the wedding chambers. I want to say, I see no spot upon you. A little taste of tomorrow morning. I, I want to bring you into a place of intimacy where you say, I am enough for you and you see it. Okay? God is doing that for all of us. And if you really want to go there, I want you tonight, as, as we close in a song that is a prayer, okay? We're going to close in a song like that is a prayer to God, that God would bring this purity in our lives that says, Lord, I'm going to say no to the things that grieve your heart. It's not a matter of trying to earn his acceptance. Man, the cross did that. that it, the blood of Christ completely satisfied the wrath of God and brought you into a place of acceptance. But there's a difference between that and being a clean vessel that doesn't grieve the Holy Spirit and you're clean for him to flow through. There's a difference. And if there's some stuff going on in your life, man, I want to encourage you tonight to even, whether it's where you're standing, to lift up your hands and holy hand, sacrifice and surrender, get down on your knees. Take some time tonight to simply seek the Lord. You might go, well, Dave, it's a little late and I'm tired. It was really late for Samuel. God woke him up. You know, he's there half asleep while Eli's really asleep. And it's like in the, in the midst of his body's tired, it's all wound down, but there was no cell phones ringing. There was no work schedule. He says, now will you listen to me? My question is, does God have your attention right now? Does he have your attention? Are you willing to just go, yes, Lord, speak to me. Your servant is listening, and I'm willing you to point out any areas that I'm bringing into this temple that aren't right before you. And I'm willing to actually feel the hurt and weep, wail, and mourn over sin that hurts your heart. I'm willing to do that, Lord. And I'm willing to walk away from anything, God, that grieves you. I will, because God, I love you. Because God, I'm here to serve you. Because God, it's all about you. It's not about me being a spouse or a parent or my profession on this earth. It's all meaningless. All of it. I want you to think about this. What if we got home tonight and we hear in the news, man, the dollar's collapsed, the banks have closed, the grocery stores now are being raided, and all this is going on, and there's no jobs to go to, and you sit there not knowing what the heck to do. Would it really matter how much money you have in the bank? Would it? Would it really matter what people think of you, what car you drive? All that would matter is the Lord. That's all that would matter. So my challenge to you is make that today. 
Make it like right now. Now is the time to seek the face of God. Now is the time to stop ignoring his voice and that unction of the Holy Spirit, that voice inside my head that I want to say is people. You know how many people I have come here and say, Dave, I don't appreciate what you said. Is it what I said or is it you're being convicted and you don't like what you're hearing? It's time to respond to God. And if we will do that, I am telling you, you'll find a joy and a peace and an intimacy with him that will increase exponentially. I don't think there's anything more important, guys. I know you can hear this message tonight and go, Dave, that, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. I'll have to think about that. Don't think about it. Just do it. Just respond to him. Just be willing. You know what it is. You know the areas that you've allowed the world to creep in your life. I don't sit there and need to read them off to you, and you don't need to sit there and ponder on them and consider if this is right or wrong. You already know, don't you? We're not stupid. We know. So let's just run to the altar, right? Grab the horns of the altar and say, God, I need your strength, and I need you to come and occupy. You're knocking on the door of my heart, and you said, if I'll hear your voice, you'll come in and you'll occupy every part of my being. Every part of shame and filth and guilt and fear, you'll occupy it, God. You'll come in and you'll sup with me. I want to sup with the Lord. How about you? Worship team, come on up. Let's do just that. Let's seek the face of our king together. Let's all bow our heads and go before the Father and just ask him to bless this time of prayer. Father, we want to come before you right now. We want to thank you for your incredible patience, for your willingness, God, to continue to speak to us when we've ignored your voice so many times. Year after year, God, you've called us by name. Year after year, you've warned us to turn away from compromise. God, we don't want to turn from you anymore. We want to acknowledge whatever you're saying to us. And we want to turn from our agenda. And we want to follow after you with all of our heart. We welcome your presence in this room tonight, Father. We invite you, Lord, to come and stand in our midst and speak to us, God. We lay down, Father God, this lie and this addiction of pornography. We lay down the lie of the shame and the filth that as if your blood is not sufficient to cover and wash it away. Father, we lay down our pride and our judgment, the hardness of heart, our unwillingness to forgive, and we thank you, Lord, that just as you've forgiven us, you've given us power to forgive others. We receive that from you, Lord. If there be any religious spirit in this room, Father God, we ask your Holy Spirit would bring a peace and a humility in this room right now in the name of Jesus. God, we are desperate for you. We are hungry for you. God, we need more of you in our lives. God, we want to know your love and how it surpasses knowledge. We want to know just how deep it goes, God. We want to lay hold of the inheritance that you gave us. So, Lord, whatever we're holding on to right now, we want to lay that down and drop it in the name of Jesus. Whatever idol we're holding on to, Father God, we cast it into the fire, Father. We ask, God, that you would just pour out a purifying move of your spirit tonight. In obedience, God, we will lift our hands and surrender our will to you, God. In obedience, we will bow our knees and we will humble ourselves in the presence of a holy God. And we will give unto you the glory, God, that you are worthy of. God, we will worship you in the splendor of your holiness, God. We will worship you in the character of your name and who you are, God. You are worthy of praise, God. You are worthy of glory, God. You are worthy of honor. Father, can we be too radical for you? Can we be too abandoned for you, Lord? If you're hearing the voice of the Lord tonight calling you to a place of rest in his presence and you hear his voice saying, come to me, turn and come. Do not harden your heart if you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit tonight. If you hear him 
calling your name, respond. Respond through surrender. Respond through confession of sin. Respond through humbling yourselves in the presence of an almighty God.